Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with, with many thanks, first of all, for uh, the Tsadra Foundation. Uh, I think it's remarkable that organizations which uh, have not primarily an academic interest, also an academic interest, are coming to the academies more and more. Like we have many uh, operations in this field in Buddhist studies, and I think it's not something normal we can expect, so I really appreciate that. And I hope that in the future these kind of corporations, be it the whole foundation, uh, be it Sadra or the Numata, uh, that can even be extended. So thanks for, for the sponsorship and thanks, of course, for uh, the invitation to be here. Wien is always very nice to come here. Uh, to be the last one is, of course, good and bad. <laughs> the good thing is that you can get a lot of impulses and try somehow to refer to, to this and the other point. Uh, the bad thing that can happen is that everything has already been said. <laughs> and that happened a little bit, and that is not meant in a, in a bad sense. Chris actually yesterday <coughs> already did most of what I had in mind, uh, because we are working partly on the same materials in a brilliant way. I couldn't do it better. So uh, that's much what I wanted to say today. So that now, basically, you have a choice. I can say the same which was said yesterday, <laughs> this is a choice one, or I can um, give a little bit of different talk with a focus on the Tathagata Gava Sutra, on which I have been working uh, years ago and on which I could extend a little bit this. Which one do you like? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess number two, right? <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go for number, number two. Uh, many of you, of course, um, know what I have been uh, working on and so and apologize for things you might already know. It might be boring, but however, there might be aspects which you have not taken into full consideration, so I will try to focus a little bit on that today. And uh, I hope that in the discussion we can also talk a little, bar, a little bit about the beginnings of Tathagatagaba even before the Sutra, because this is an aspect which hasn't been dealt with here at all. And it's a very good point to put the beginnings of a tradition at the end of a symposium. So that also fits well together nicely. Yeah, as you can see, there are four translations of the Tathagatagava Sutra, one from the 8th century into Chinese by Mogavajra, one by Buddhabhadra from the 5th century. They are not uh, very much different, but there are differences. And then we have uh, the canonical Tibetan translation by Shakyara Pabha and Yeshede. And we have another translation which is similar but different, <laughs> uh, which is a second Tibetan translation found in the so-called New Art Manuscript Kanjur, originally from Batang, which is not a very polished version. And it might be that this has served as a kind of predecessor of the canonical translation, but that's not absolutely clear. And finally, we have uh, my book published many, many years ago, in which I tried to bring these theological aspects together. So after a decade of soft slumber, recent years have witnessed a number of exciting new publications on the Indian tradition of Buddha nature thought in Sanskrit and that you know by now called usually Tathagatagaba Buddha Dhatu. There exist various conceptualizations of how this precious element is present in living beings. Could be, it could be present in them like a seed which still needs to grow, which is certainly an aspect in the early strand. But there are other descriptions that carry the idea that this element is at all times fully developed inside living beings and what is needed is just its purification from its outside impurities. Such impurities are described as being attached to the element but only peripheral and temporary without ever affecting the essence of that precious element. Needless to say, the history of this general idea, of, of this general idea that all sentient beings have Buddha nature uh, is complex. And it was talked about it yesterday, the publication of Michael Radish's monograph on the Mahaparinirvana Sutra in 2015 did not make things easier, but rather led to a quite different theory about the very origin of Buddha nature thought in India. So. I thought I'd show you this book here by Michael Radich, published in 2015, published at uh, Hamburg, uh, which has a kind of paradigm shifting content in terms of the history of Tathagatagaba. And there's another book which also relates, and I think Chris mentioned it yesterday, uh, a new translation, a Western translation, uh, and study of the Anunatva Purnatva Nirdesha Parivarta by Jonathan Silk, which was published, I think, the year before. 
so quite remarkably, two major works on Tathagatagaba, which after years in which nothing happened, then came out uh, in a couple of years distance. And now we are waiting for Chris' book, of course, coming out hopefully this year or next year, which is another major contribution to the Tathagatagaba studies. By the way, uh, all these publications here from the Numata Center of Buddhist Studies are downloadable, free. Just go to our webpage, Buddhismuskunde Uni Hamburg. Uh, it's usually the case that after one year, then the print is out, we put it online, on, online for uh, free access download. So, back to Redditch. He argued, based on his own research and on several articles by a scholar called Stephen Hodge, whom I have never met personally. He's a UK-based scholar and it's difficult to get hold of him. We had invited him for the Hamburg conference in Tathagatagawa, but uh, I didn't get uh, a response. So based on Stephen Hodge's ideas and Radish's ideas, I think both of them, um, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra is now considered to be the earliest text propounding that all living beings have Buddha nature originating, and here we follow the dating of uh, Radish and Hodge, maybe already uh, as early as the second century CE. Redditch argues that the ideas that led to the genesis of the term Tathagatagaba originated as part of a wider pattern of the Satic Buddhology. We heard about that yesterday. Ideas holding that Buddhas are not really as what they appear. Doing this, Redditch gave the whole discussion of the origin of this strand of thought a new origin and assumed an interesting and partly new motive with regard to the genesis of this idea. So what do these new research results mean for the study of the intellectual history of the Buddha nature thought in India? In order to clarify this point, let me explain a bit more about the assumptions made in the past decades on this issue. For my own research, I had followed the approach by Takasaki Jikido. He's often called the modern father of Tathagatagawa studies in Japan, uh, active from the 1960s until uh, the 90s, 1990s died some years ago, three, four years ago. And he had firmly assumed that the Tathagatagaba Sutra is the first scripture propagating the idea of Buddha nature in explicit terms. Takasaki's main argument was based on the assumption that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra contains a quotation from the Tathagatagaba Sutra and thus that the Tathagatagaba Sutra must be the older of the two texts. We now know that this apparent quotation does not refer to the Tathagatagaba Sutra. Chris hinted that yesterday, but I think you didn't mention it explicitly. Uh, but this so-called quotation from the Tathagatagaba Sutra is not the Tathagatagaba Sutra, but a section within the Mahaparinirvana Sutra itself. So the argument that the Tathagatagaba Sutra must be earlier, based on this quotation, is not holdable anymore. And I think that makes really sense. So before now, I will, uh, before we go into some philological details um, on the textual history of the Tathagatagaba Sutra itself, I thought I'd show you um, an interesting collection of terms as they appear in the Tathagatagaba Sutra, as we have talked a lot about <coughs> terminology here. So this is um, all the terms which are used for Buddha nature in the Tathagatagaba Sutra taken from the canonical Tibetan translation and here the Sanskrit or sometimes uh, a reconstruction of the um, Sanskrit. Uh, this is just in order to show you how little standardized the vocabulary used in this very early layer of Tathagatagaba teaching has been. You see terms like simply Tathagata, then the term Tathagata Dharmata, the term Tathagata Garba only three or four times in the whole sutra. We'll talk about that more extensively. Tathagata Jnana, Jinnakaya, Buddhatva, Tathagata Jnana Darshana, a very, very uh, crucial term in the Lotus Sutra. If you remember in the second chapter, this is uh, the core element of the Lotus Sutra, which is based on this term. Buddha, Tathagata, Svayambhutva, Tathagata Tva, Buddha Bhumi, Jinna, Sukatanyana, Tathagata Gotra, probably Tathagata Datu, there's a, we'll talk about that, a shift in terminology, Dharmata, and then simply the qualities, namely the Buddha Dharma, 
Anasra Vajnana Ratna, Budanyana, Jinaputra, Dashabalani, the Ten Powers, Avinasha Dharmin, Avinasha Dharmata, Prakriti, that's in a verse, so it's probably an abbreviation for something longer. The special qualities of a Buddha, Mahadharma Niti, Sugata Kaya, Buddha Jnana Kosha, Nidhi. And I think this is the last one. Garba Gatta Tathagata Dharmata, so something like the Dharmata of a Tathagata being in the womb, being inside. Tathagata Jnana Sukata Kaya, Jinakaya, and again Tathagata Jnana Darshana. So you see a broad range of, of uh, terminology, far from any hint of being standardized, as one might expect from the term Tathagata Gaba Sutra. So in the process of editing the Tibetan and Chinese versions of the Tathagata Gaba Sutra, I also worked on an in-depth analysis of its content. Based on a detailed look into the structure and terminology of the sutra, in all of its available four versions, I've mentioned that before, what became clear was the following. As is widely known, the core of the Tathagata Gaba Sutra is formed by a section of nine similes, and several of these similes have been mentioned, I don't have to go through that again, starting with an introductory description of huge lotus flowers in the sky in which Buddhas are seated, all with a beautiful appearance. I think Don started his uh, keynote lecture with that uh, imagine. When suddenly the leaves of the lotus flowers start to wither, turning ugly and foul, they close themselves and the Buddhas become wrapped with the lotus flowers' ugly petals. This introductory imagery at the beginning of the text also forms the first simile and defines the main structural pattern for the following eight other similes. And that's now quite interesting. We go back to our folios. Okay, have a look at that. All of these nine similes center around the idea that Buddha nature of living beings is hidden in ugly coverings. And these coverings, of course, are the klishas, the emotional intellectual defilements. But just like the Buddhas within the flowers, their Buddha nature remains unaffected by the ugly surrounding and at the same time invisible to other sentient beings. To make things now a bit more complicated, look at the, at the folio. At first glance, the introductory section of the Tathagata Gaba Sutra and the following exposition of the nine similes seems to be from one mold. The descriptions of the similes are all vivid and concrete. The similes appear to be constructed in a unified fashion. They all start with a description of a more or less well-known occurrence or process met with in daily life. Well, the flowers, the lotus flowers seem to be an exception, but all the other eight similes are quite down to earth. You can find them basically when you go out of your house. And then draw a comparison between it and the spiritual sphere. At the end, the prime role of the Buddha is illustrated as that of teaching living beings about their unknown potential of Buddhahood and urging them to make use of that. From a doctrinal point of view too, there seems to be no reason to assume that the similes are not the creation of a single author or a single group put forward as a more or less monolithic construct. Nevertheless, an in-depth examination of the first simile leads to several observations which clearly go against the assumption that the introduction and the nine similes had already been arranged in their present form from the very beginning. The most obvious manifestation of textual heterogeneity is the first simile itself. After his announcement that he would expound the Tathagata Gaba Sutra, the Buddha sets about formulating the first simile, which, regarding the Upamana, which is the part of the simile used to illustrate the subject matter, is taken from the setting of the introductory section. Yeah, so now we're moving from the inter introductory setting to the first simile, which I now call the old simile. You will see why. Then, when already having started to narrate, to narrate the simile, he abruptly starts again to recount the first simile, this time with emphasis on different elements. A close look at both versions of this first simile, that is to say the old and the new version, that's how I call it, 
revealed several inconsistencies which indicate that the two parts do not correspond harmoniously. A detailed analysis leads to the conclusion that these inconsistencies in the flow of the text can be somehow explained if we are to assume that here two different lotus similes have been combined with only the new simile using the term Tathagatagaba while the old lotus simile draws upon the introductory setting as described before. The new simile clearly follows the structure and narrative line of the other eight following similes. And that's, I think, something really uh, striking, which if you just read the sutra, if you listen to it, you will never find out. Probably you have to, de to deal with that for a year or so. It took me a year to see that. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the term Tathagata Garba, which gave the name to the sutra, is only found in this little piece. Not in the introductory setting, not in the first part of the simile number one, not in any of the other eight similes. What we can see from these and also some other instances is that originally we had probably to deal with two separate parts. On the one hand, the introductory section, pouring coherently into the old simile without any mention of the term Tathagatagarbha, and on the other hand, a series of eight similes, again, without any mention of the term Tathagatagarbha, which, for one reason or another, somebody or a group wanted to combine with the introductory setting and the old lotus simile. And in order to structurally adapt the old simile to the set of eight, a secondary or new lotus simile was interpolated into the original one, which was structurally parallel to the following eight similes. Without looking at the complete first simile in some detail, hardly anybody can notice the fact that here two different accounts of the lotus simile go together. There's also a different choice of vocabulary which is, of course, a little bit hidden by the, by the uh, Tibetan translation, but you can still figure out there is a different ductus in the two settings. The new lotus simile functions as a joint between the two parts, namely the introductory setting on the one hand and the other eight similes to follow. And more importantly, I just mentioned it, the new lotus simile introduces the compound Tathagatagaba, which does not show up anywhere else among this introductory setting and the other similes. It appears that's true at the end of the sutra, but this is a completely different section. It has nothing to do with um, the nine original similes of the Tathagatagaba Sutra. So I think for the understanding of the genesis of the term Tathagatagaba and the wider concept of Buddha nature, these facts are quite indicative. It is certainly possible that the technical use of the term Tathagatagaba as relating to Buddha nature predates the Tathagatagaba Sutra itself, and that the sutra's aim was primarily to illustrate lucidly how this term should be understood. I would say a kind of subsequent explanation of a term already in use. You can find that often, I think, in literature. In other words, someone wanted to give an explanation which aimed at shedding light on this term and its associated ideas through easily apprehensible formulations in a kind of follow-up illustration. This explanation now seems not unlikely in light of the research by Michael Radich on the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, about which we had heard yesterday. And you remember the Mahaparinirvana Sutra uses both terms equally, Tathagatagarbha and Buddha Dato. One of the questions to be asked, if that is the case, is why throughout the nine similes of the Tathagatagarbha Sutra, the term Tathagatagarbha is used exclusively in the Lotus simile. If we really assume that uh, Tathagatagarbha Sutra tries to illustrate this, that term from the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, you would expect that it uses it throughout the whole text, not only in this little section above. If the authors of the Tathagatagarbha Sutra were aware of the Buddha nature tradition of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and wanted to add another expression on this line of thought, why would they not use this crucial term widely throughout all the similes? Why would they not also use the term Tathagatadatu, of course, if they had this in mind? So, it might be the better solution to assume that the similes of the Tathagatagaba Sutra emerge from a different, maybe different geographical, maybe different social, or maybe a very different <coughs> doctrinal context, a context in which the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and its tradition were not really known. That's maybe the possibility which is more likely. Later on, once they had learned about the similarity between their own ideas of this, let's say, uh, early Tathagatagaba Sutra uh, creators and the ideas exposed in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, 
They tried to introduce the key term Tathagata Tagaba into their own literary product, but did that only subsequently, as I have shown above. Not unlikely, you, you can imagine that um, it often happens that ideas come up for the first time at the same period. Uh, it happens in, among scholars also, and you realize, oh, this guy is also doing that. Well, let's see, what did he do? Let's take at least some terms and put it in before I publish it. <laughs> could, could, be, could be a model how it works. The similes of the Tagadagaba Sutra could thus be an old or even older independent collection of illustrations of how Buddha nature and sentient beings could be imagined without the use of any standardized technical vocabulary denoting this nature. So still, I think, that maybe not the Tathagatagaba Sutra as we have it, but as it consists in maybe the eight old similes could be of quite old origin, maybe even predating the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, uh, because there is no hint at any kind of standardization. There is the use of the term in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra is rather uh, standardized, of course. It cannot be excluded that both sutras, the Tathagatagaba Sutra and the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, originated at approximately the same time but in different contexts. Don, uh, you mentioned it. The scarcity of information about literary works in matters of date and origin in ancient India is well known. We don't know anything about the circumstances of the origin of these texts. However, judging from the textual evidence in the Tathagatagaba Sutra alone, this is not the only possible scenario we can paint based on analysis. And now, this is another attempt to explain that which I followed in my, in my publication, namely the term Tathagatagaba could equally be an ad hoc creation resulting from combining the two previously separate parts, the introductory setting and the eight similars. Namely, alongside the process of joining the two parts while composing the new lotus simile, the term Tathagatagaba could have been created in its technical meaning relating to the Buddha nature of all sentient beings as a fitting and comprehensive, I don't know how to call it in English, something like a catchword for what was deemed to be the essence of a set of the similes. In both cases, scenario one, the term Tathagatagaba was inherited from another text such as the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. Scenario two, the term Tathagatagaba was coined newly by the composers of the Tathagatagaba Sutra. The sutra's introductory setting with the first simile offers a plausible explanation for why the use of the creation of this catchword would have been considered particularly fitting in this context. And here, I mean the several occurrences of the Sanskrit term garba, namely in Patma garba, a lotus calyx, uh, in lotus kelch, uh, in the introductory setting. In these lotus calyxes, which are called Patma garba, at the introduction of the sutra, full-fledged Buddhas are seated in perfect meditation. Yeah? This is uh, the story Don has introduced us to. The same situation is then claimed to hold true for the Buddha inside sentient beings. Though each sentient being hosts a Buddha within itself, sentient beings are not aware of it because this Buddha is still covered by emotional and intellectual defilements. Here again, garba is used, and in both contexts it means the inside. First the inside of a lotus, the lotus calyx, and then the inside of sentient beings as the parallel. Based on this lotus simile, it is thus clear how we should understand the term Tathagatagaba when it is stated that all living beings are Tathagatagaba, namely that all sentient beings carry a Tathagata within themselves, and that's the classical discussion which you have led for many years. Uh, here, Tathagatagaba is to be understood as a Bahovrini compound, as simply containing a Tathagata. If you want, if we want to link that to uh, the discussion yesterday with Ningbo, probably you could argue containing a Tathagata essentially, somehow as your centerpiece, not just peripherally behind your ear, but somehow <laughs> in the center of your body. In terms of Sanskrit grammar, in this instance we are dealing with a Bahuvrihi compound, an adjective referring to living beings, with Gaba meaning nothing more than containing. Uh, quite different from what uh, Garba is later connected to, namely the meaning of embryo, womb, offspring, seed, essence, kernel, or member of a family lineage. These are all the other connotations, which I think are not in the foreground here in our sutra. Mm -hmm. This is clear, however, does not mean that the interpretation of the term Tathagatagaba in the sutra as a whole could be confined to this rather technical or weak notion of Garba in the sense of insight or to contain once the other eight similes were brought into play. 
Even so, the term Tathagatagaba does not appear in any of the other eight similes. The scenes depicted in these eight similes illustrating how living beings, Buddha nature could be imagined, would almost certainly widen the range of possible interpretations of a compound and shape its understanding. So it's a typical example. Once this term has been framed, it is open to all kinds of interpretation. I think it's impossible to pin down Tathagatagaba to one meaning, as in the moment it has been created, it's unfolded, it's ambiguity, it's, associ it's, it's associativeness, it was impossible to avoid. Okay, five minutes. One challenging question in the discussion of a new chronology by Reddish is that, if the Mahaparinirvana Sutra was truly a representative of a mainstream tradition of Buddha nature thought, and not only, as had been thought before, a kind of radical and later sidetrack leading to a dead end uh, strand of sutras, why did the authors of the Ratnagotra Vibhaga make use of a Mahaparinirvana Sutra only in one sole passage? That's rather struggling. I think I asked you this question already yesterday. It's only found once in a not very central um, simile where um, I think a Vaiduria stone is thrown into a pool and it clarifies and makes this whole uh, pool beautiful and that represents somehow then the, the, uh, the Buddha nature. But it's not one of the strongest, Chris, you will agree, probably not one of the strongest similes found in the Panivana Sutra. Otherwise, there is no hint on this sutra. Uh, it's not cited. Of course, the fact that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra features so infrequently among the many quotations in the Ratna Gotra comes as a surprise considering the richness of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra in terms of similes. Regarding this point, it is clear that the authors of the Ratna Gotra Vibhaga, for one reason or the other, preferred the similes of the Tathagatagaba Sutra. So maybe at this time the Mahaparinirvana Sutra was already quite old. We talked about that yesterday. Or uh, this is an idea uh, Michael Radich also has. It was maybe associated with a kind of strange cult, a cult, and mainstream Buddhists said, well, let's not go too much into that direction. We don't know. Equally hard to explain is the fact that the Tathagatagaba Sutra, assuming it follows or builds on the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, as far as its Sanskrit wording can be reconstructed, and as it is reflected in the, in the quotations of the Ratna Gotra Vibhaga, does not know of a formulation Tathagata Garbo Asti Sarva Sadvesha, which is found in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. Um, the Tathagatagaba Sutra instead reads Sarva Sattvas Tathagatagaba. So clearly, again, he knows the compound Tathagatagaba only as a Bahuvrihi, not as an entity already itself, Tathagatagaba as, an, as a, a Tathpurusha, as an entity. That is not known there. So that again speaks against the idea that the Tathagatagaba Sutra creators knew the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, I guess. Or they knew it not very well, at least. The same question can be posed for why the Tathagatagaba Sutras almost make no use of the term Datu, again, only in one dubious passage. Could a possible reason be that the Tathagatagaba Sutra was simply not interested in the issue of relic worship from which the term Datu originally stems? That's an idea, that Datu was still strongly associated with relic worship, and they might say, what has relic worship to do with the Buddha nature? Well, we don't use that. We don't know. At this early stage of Buddha nature thought, I sh it should be obvious that we are dealing with a genre of literature that is rich in narratives, very rich in narratives. You will see Chris' book is full of, of beautiful similes and narratives, uh, while relying on terminology that doesn't sharply define how Buddha nature is to be understood. I'm almost done. This is common for the early stage of new spiritual or religious movements, which are still developing a well-structured system of thought. It is exactly this not being very precise, quite in opposite to what we have been dealing here the last two or three days in, in scholastic, uh, very detailed, sophisticated discussions. It's quite the opposite. So it's exactly this not being very precise, which might open the door to associating key terms from various kinds of contexts, a strategy maybe willingly employed in order to increase the potential to propagate the new teachings more effectively also among groups which would initially not be interested. But this is my health politics. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you, Michael. So, uh, did I understand you right? It is possible that uh, the Mahaparinirvana Mahasudra and the Tathagatagarbha Sutra 
not just uh, coexisted and developed uh, simultaneously, just in different areas. And at some point, only like uh, interact, there was an interaction only at some point, or uh, yeah. is it that the Nirvana Sutra is earlier than the Well, both is possible. There's no definite answer, but. Uh, I think it's quite sure that um, what we find in the Tathagatagava Sutra with the similes, it's probably, that's my take, um, a collection, uh, a gathering of all kinds, of all the ideas of how one has to imagine some precious substance in sentient beings. Not under the term Tathagatagava, not under the term uh, Buddha Datu, who maybe somebody brought together because uh, he thought, well, it can be a positive encouragement for sentient beings, for human beings, to know that this precious essence is there. Call it however you want. Maybe he took it from different accounts in the, in the literature. And later on, these people, or he learned that there's a similar strand based on the Mahaparinibbana Sutra. And at that time, maybe the term Tathagatagava had already appeared. And he said, well, if that is so similar, let me market my ideas by also making use of this term itself good. That is, that is a possible scenario, I think. Yeah. And it's well possible that um, the similes in the Tathagatagava Sutra are very old, older than what we have in the Mahaparinibbana Sutra, but it's also uh, possible that they originated around the same time and they were geographically far away, or maybe that um, these were groups which are not in very close contact. I don't know of how much you can assume that there is a high degree of fluidity of ideas at that time. Maybe it was rather segmented. That we don't know. Um, Greg, thank you so much. A question on the word, actually. Uh, yeah. um, in the, word list, the terminology? Yeah, okay. the terminology is there. Yeah, there's a talk about the Jnana Yeah. I think it's in the next. Yeah. In what context yeah. is that? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a particular context. It's the seventh simile, which is. What's the seventh simile? Statue in rags. The statue. The statue uh, in in the mall. In, in the, the statue covered in rags by the side of the road. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, I don't think there's a specific connection to, to the context, but Tathagata Jnana Darshana comes up a couple of times, three, four times in different similes. But uh, I don't know if I mentioned it when I talked about that. It's a term used in the Lotus Sutra in the second chapter, which is considered generally as the core section of the Lotus Sutra. Then the Buddha explains why he manifests here in the world, namely to teach the uh, fulfillment, the encouragement for all sentient beings to get Tathagata Jnana Darshana. So it's a core section of the Lotus Sutra, and I'm not surprised that uh, this terminology from the Lotus Sutra is found here, given that, Chris, also you talked about that yesterday. I also had an article many years abo uh, ago about the uh, foundation of the Lotus Sutra for the creation of the Tathagatagava Sutra. Yeah? The idea of Ekayana, the universalist idea that all sentient beings can attain um, awakening, that is certainly taken from the Lotus Sutra. But also the Lotus Sutra com contains some nice narratives. I don't know if you have ever studied in some detail these narratives, but there is, for instance, uh, one story of two friends who are drinking together. And uh, he falls asleep, and one friend takes a jewel and puts it in the hemp of, of the other one here. It sues it in. He doesn't know it. And then this guy goes out into the world, and he has a very bad fate. He gets sick, he is poor, he has nothing, and he thinks he's lost, and he comes back to his friends and says, look, I've ruined everything, I have nothing, and Vishnu says, wow, how comes? You have a jewel with you, you don't know that? <laughs> yeah. Which is a wonderful example in the Tathagatagava context, but it's no hint of Buddha nature in the Lotus Sutra. It's implied somehow, but it's basically the next step which should come. It's not spoken out in the Lotus Sutra. So I'm not surprised that Tathagatajnana Darshana in this passage is also found in the Tathagatagava Sutra because it's a clear uh, pre-runner of the Tathagatagava Sutra. But, but what's being seen there? That's basically a, a term for Buddha nature. It, it itself is a term for yeah, Buddha, Buddha nature. nature. Yes, definitely. I told you it's not very precise. We are talking about sutra literature. Don't compare to what you have in, in 13th, 14th, 17th century Tibet. It's a very different issue. They make use of all kinds of terms and throw it out. 
somebody will buy it and say, that's good, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't, yeah. Thank you for crediting me for quoting your translation. <laughs> <laughs> um, to get back to these similes, um, as you noted, it's so hard for us to come up with any kind of chronology or know what happened when the media occurred to the black way. But the similes, in a way, provide some sort of key that I just wanted to ask you about. Because when we look at the Lotus Sutra, they're almost all uh, similes of mistaken identity. Yeah, that's a very good question. And believe me, I've thought many, many, many days, weeks, months on that. First of all, the number of similes, nine, does, tell us, does this tell us something, nine similes? I think it's, Lotus Sutra has around that, huh? nine or eight, sometimes ten, yeah, depending on how you count, but that's maybe one hint. But uh, as the context uh, goes, it's not so fancy stories like the Lotus Sutra. You have cereals, and it says, well, some people try to eat that cereal without taking off the husks. Uh, it doesn't taste and they throw it away. How stupid they are. Of course, you have to take them out and eat it. Or the other example of uh, a golden mold, a golden statue, which is, which is uh, fabricated in the Cire Perdue method in a, in a mold. So these are probably all instances with, well, you have some, at some time seen in daily life. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Chakravartin is an exception, yeah. the, the poor house. But a poor house, again, you have poor houses in India. So it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. It's much less fancy and, and, and uh, imaginatory. If there is something which binds these examples together, I think it's this. There's a certain sense of, of realism, mm -hmm. of, you know, we are here, we're talking about things you know. There's no real metaphysics, and I try to tell you about these precious elements, which can be called Tathagatagaba, but it's not important. It has all kinds of other names, but it's hidden there. Mm -hmm. It's hidden, you have to look for it, or maybe somebody has to help you dig it out. I think this is the main, the main connection. I also have thought about the sequence of the nine mm -hmm. similes. You can see in the analysis by the Ratnagotra Vibhaga, it has big problems in trying to um, structure these nine similes. It comes up with three categories, and it's not that, I think, three, or maybe they, they follow a particular sequence, but it's randomly. I think there is no strict connection why a particular sutra is subsumed under particular categories. You can see that even the Ratnagotra Vibhaga had problems in systemizing that. It's not that the first five are, more, five are more dynamic and the others are more static. No, it's, it's kind of really coincidence, I guess. But they come from daily surrounding the honey. Everybody knows that. So that's a clear difference to the Lotus Sutra, I think, which is more... Literary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Do you have some idea about intended leader or uh, uh, audience of this um, how to do, how to do sutra? Well, certainly not philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly the 99% we have not been talking much about here. Yeah, it's... I would think Tathagatagava Sutra tries to supply the Lotus Sutra with some justification. Yeah, the story of Sada Paribhuta and the Lotus Sutra, that's the guy who uh, goes around and says everybody, hey, uh, you will become a Buddha, you too, you too. And these people say, hey, what? What did you say? I will become a Buddha? Don't mess up with me. And you can read in the text that they took stones and throw it after him. They were really upset. Yeah, this Sada Paribhuta uh, would have been much easier could he said, well, there's a sutra, you know. <laughs> this here, the Tagaragava Sutra, you can read that the Buddha preached everybody has the potential of the Buddha. Obviously, he didn't have it. 
So in a sense, I think that Tathagata Gaba Sutra tries to fill this gap and say, okay, here is the proof. Buddha nature is there, it's all right what is in the Lotus Sutra, and it must be universal. I think that make might Buddhism be... Great again. Yeah. Say again? Make Buddhism great again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think you probably, you probably can find the audience uh, among the same people who were interested in the Lotus Sutra, I guess. Certainly not philosophy, I'm sorry. Um, we've had a lot of these conversations already, yes. but I will, I will make one of these a little more public now. I'd, I'd, I'd spoken about these, what I see as two streams after the Mahavara Nirvana, something that is, actually as you said, more corporeal, something more realistic. And then there's this text, which I struggle to see influenced by one particular other work, and I struggle to see its particular influence on another work within that tradition. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of what kind of model of Tathagata Gaba? If across the rest of this literature we've got an account of something, maybe called a self that's in there, and then something else that could be the mind, which isn't something that you'd see. No. What are your thoughts about where this fits in in these developments? Well, taking up your, your chart from yesterday where you said there's, I don't know if you used it here, but we did that in Hamburg, but there is a kind of more body-oriented strand, yeah, like the Mahaparinivana Sutra, where Buddha nature is almost kind of entity which is based in your body, and then the more, I think you call it mentalist strand, good name, Srimala Sutra, Lankavatara, and so on, where it's more identified with the, with the mind, the heart of, of the mind. I think uh, seen in this, in this um, categories, it's certainly more on the body side. It's not very sophisticated in terms of, you know, mind philosophy, that's very clear. I see two, two major texts which influence the Tathagatagava Sutra because you asked for that. One is the Lotus Sutra. The other one is uh, this sutra which is called Tathagatot Pati Sambhava Nirdesha coming from the Avatamsaka, mm -hmm. which is an interesting text because it basically praises the greatness of the Buddha and it says the Buddha's voice is heard everywhere in the universe. He's penetrating the whole universe. And at the end it says the Buddha's Jnana, the Buddha's knowledge, is penetrating the whole universe and it is penetrating each sentient being's mind. And that I think is quite important. The Tathagata Sutra takes that up but doesn't look at it from the perspective of the universal Buddha but it looks at it from the perspective of the individual and says, well, if that is so, <coughs> then a part of this Buddha knowledge is within ourselves. But I think it's clearly an inspiration. Also, if you look philologically at the structure of the narrative in the Tathagata Pati Sambhava Nidesha, it's almost the same pattern. So there must be a close connection. So these two strands I can see. Well, you know that already. <laughs> <laughs> Some more questions or remarks? Yeah. Mm. There's, there's something sort of appealing about this model of uh, a collection of similes that sort of that uh, you know, were, were intended for a less sophisticated audience. I mean, is that what you're speculating? That whereas the Lotus is very exalted and, and, and literary, this is sort of indicating some kind of teaching for the general public that uh, might have been circulating orally for a long time and then somebody collected it, wrote it down. Is that, uh, yeah. Do I understand you right? That would be my wish, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think to, to I tend to think in very positive terms about the Tathagata Gava stream. Maybe this is something we have to raise in the discussion section. Yeah. That uh, here we haven't talked at all about ethical consequences of Tathagata Gava, which is certainly an important aspect. Uh, one interesting point in the Tathagata Gava Sutra is that every simile ends with the statement that. After you attain, you liberate this Buddha nature, you become active to work for other sentient beings. So however you want to take that, it's mentioned and it seems to be an important aspect in this strand, in this sutra, that somehow it has to have an effect on other sentient beings, helping them yeah, or working for them. So from my feeling, this strand of Tathagatagava sutra, of Tathagatagava, early Tathagatagava, is associated closely this, with a very this worldly actively engaged strand of Buddhism, but maybe that's just wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we should uh, conclude here. Thank you very much.